Welcome everybody, glad you're here and uh, you can find your seats. Um, it's a busy Sunday, we had a wedding yesterday, it was awesome. Uh, those of us that got to be there and celebrate Annie and Evan, uh, I think they're watching online, so you can wave at them. So, um, but they are, uh, they're getting ready to leave for their honeymoon and uh, that's an exciting time and so just really thankful. It was such a God honoring wedding. Um, you as the body of Christ, it was just great for their family to see how loved they were. I had multiple family members come to me and just tell me about some of you, some of your parents were there and came to me and just said, man, I'm just so grateful for how my son or my daughter has been loved by you guys. And that's really humbling. I don't take that pridefully. I take that really kind of, do we do that good of a job? <laughs> me personally. And um, I'm just, I'm really grateful. And it was a great celebration. Um, and, and yeah, really thankful. We are continuing in our series. This is the last of our series in 2 Corinthians. So we're in chapter 13. Um, remember, our series is called The God of All Comfort. And the reason for that is because Paul says that's why he wrote the book. He's praising God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. And he's trying to help the Corinthians see that they can be comforted by the fact that God has loved them, he has warned them, they have repented, um, and Paul just wants them to know how comforted he is by their walk and their willingness to turn from their sin and to confront sin in their church um, and instead of allowing it just to take place. And so as we wrap up the book, Paul is, what we're going to look at this morning is something, well, last week we looked at the fact of, um, it's not, there you go, is uh, seeking and building and what are we seeking? What are we trying to build? Paul wraps up the book. He's trying to communicate to the people of God, hey, what are you seeking in your life? Where do you seek comfort? Where do you try to build comfort in your life? Paul's kind of laying that out with the believers. And then he comes to the end of his book, and what we're going to look at today, which is pretty clear, is Paul says, okay, there's a test. There's a lot of you who know there's a test, <laughs> because this is the week. <laughs> And last week was the week of the tests, right? It, it, you're, you're in the thick of it. And Paul says it's no different in the Christian life. It, it, and, and you know what? If we're really honest, there's something comforting about tests. If we're really honest, there's something comforting about being able to go into a test, to go into a classroom and say, I've done the work. I know the information. I'm excited about Telling people, telling my professor, telling those who have taught me that I know it. Like, like, this is good. But most of us don't approach tests that way because we know we haven't studied and we haven't worked diligently. And so we're like, no tests, no tests. And quite honestly, our modern Christian life is kind of that way. We are so busy trying to give people comfort that we don't test anymore. You say you're a Christian. I'm a Christian. Oh, you are. And then it's, that's it. Some celebrity puts out they're a Christian. You're posting. Oh, they're a Christian. Well, are they? Have they passed any test? And again, it's not my job to judge salvation. Okay. And Paul, we'll look at this this morning. Paul is telling the individual to test. And he also looks at the church and says, look, you've got to be careful of those who call themselves believer, believers, but they keep failing the test. Like there's no evidence that they, that they follow Christ. They say they know Jesus. They say they love him. They say all these things. But then when you look at their life over a period of time, not just, oh, they messed up once, you look and go, I don't see anything. And we shouldn't look at them and say, and that's why we hate you and we kick you out of here. That's not what your professors do, right? They test you. A good, a good teacher will test you multiple times through a semester, not just wait and hope you got all the information and drop a final test, right? Because they, they know that you're kind of irresponsible. You're in college. You're young. There's a lot of stuff going on. And so they kind of want to give you quizzes and tests to kind of, it's coming. Do you know, do you know up to this point? Because if you don't, you're not going to know the next point and the next point. And good teachers Good parents, good authority figures do this. They, they give us opportunities to test ourselves so that we can take confidence. It's like a child learning to walk, right? 
you test them and they're like, and they fall down. They're like, oh, they didn't take a step. No, you can do it. And then they take a step and it's like, they take a step and the whole room explodes in praise. We don't look at them and go, stupid idiot, can't even walk across the room, you dumb little child. That's not what we do with kids, right? The test that they needed to pass was, was, was just taking the next step. That was the only test they needed to pass. And when they pass it, we as parents are like, woo, that was awesome. And we're showing videos and grandparents. And, like, and when they walk across the room and then they fall into the arms of the other parent, we don't go, well, you shouldn't have fallen down. Like, take another, gosh, I'm never, this kid's stupid. That's not what we do, Right? And we fall down and we get back up and we help them all the way through the process. It's, it, that's how the Christian life is supposed to work. But I'm telling you, we've come to a modern Christianity that's all about giving people comfort in some decision they say they made without any testing. And that is dangerous because it may mean that their soul really isn't God's. And that should break our hearts. And that's what Paul is concerned about. He's like, I don't know if this is breaking your heart or not. It breaks my heart to see this happening in the church. It breaks my heart to see people say they're believers and then say and do these things. I'm, yes, I'm angry, but I'm broken hearted. And you shouldn't find comfort in, hey, we all get along. Sometimes you need to not get along. If you've been in a relationship, any relationship, parental, friends, teacher, doesn't matter, employer, there's always a moment where you need to not get along. The, the, you, you need to have that conversation. They need to have that conversation with you. And you've got to get to the truth. You've got to get to some truth that you can agree on so you can move forward in the relationship. And that's exactly what Paul's laying out when you see this last section. So let's read this together. 2 Corinthians 13, starting in verse 2, he said, I gave a warning, and I give a warning, as when I was present the second time. So now while I am absent to those who sinned before and to all the rest, if I come again, I will not be lenient, since you seek proof of Christ speaking in me. He is not weak towards you, but powerful among you. In fact, he was crucified in weakness, but he lives by God's power. For we who are weak in him, we're all weak, yet towards you we will live with him by God's power. Test yourselves, verse 5 says, to see if you're in the faith. Examine, he repeats it. Examine yourself, or do you not recognize for yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? So he's not trying to get him to doubt. He's saying he's in you, unless you fail the test. And I hope you will recognize that we are not failing the test. Now we pray to God that you will do nothing wrong. Not that we may appear to pass the test, but that you may do what is right, even though we may appear to fail. For we are not able to do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. In fact, we rejoice when we are weak and you are strong. We also pray for this, your maturity. This is why I'm writing these things while absent. This is why I'm writing this letter, he says, that when I am there, I will not use severity in keeping with the authority the Lord gave me for building up and not for tearing down. Finally, brothers, rejoice. Rejoice. Be restored, be encouraged, be of the same mind, be at peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for the reading of your word. Lord, I know this morning during the holiday season can be a hard time for people. Lord, it can be a celebratory time, but it can also be difficult. It can be hard because there's things that aren't comfort comforting. There are family tragedies that have happened. There are the reality of maybe not being able to, to buy the things you want to buy and do the things you want to do. And there's family members that are missing because they're traveling or gone. And Lord, there can just be so many expectations and so many disappointments around this time of year. But Lord, this time of year is supposed to be a time when we remember hope when we find comfort in the fact that you came and lived a simple life to show us that we could live that kind of a life and honor you. You gave us the purpose of the Bible and Lord, you passed the test. You never sinned your entire life. You died on the cross as the perfect sacrifice and you came back to life to show us that you have the power to help us pass the test. 
So we thank you this morning. Please open our ears and our eyes and our hearts to you in your name. Amen. So as we dive in, the first part, Paul says, I gave a warning when I was present the second time. Now I give a warning while I'm absent to those who sinned before and to all the rest. He's saying, look, I warned you when I came the first time. I saw all this sin. I saw all these problems. I didn't hold back. It was obvious. Like Paul's not going around like on a CIA mission, okay? He's not doing a CIA mission to find out all the sin. It's just obvious. He's seeing it. And he's like, I can't help but address what I see and talk about it because I care about the church and I care about you. And then he says, look, when I'm absent, I'm going to even talk more boldly, which he talked about before. And he said, look, I'm coming again. Look, that is such a built in kind of crazy statement because Jesus said what? I'm coming again. So Paul, like by saying that, Paul's kind of a reminder of like, well, I'm coming again, but I'm not the final test. There's another one coming again (laughs) that will be the final test. And then Paul says, I will not be lenient. Why? Because I love you. I, I don't want you to just keep doing stupid things because I love you. I want you to learn the information so I'm not going to be lenient because I've already given you the information. I've given you multiple opportunities to pass the test. I've given you grace. I gave you time to make up the paper and you're still not doing it. So if you don't do it by the time I get there, like you remember when Paul says I'm coming, it's not like he's jumping on a plane and he's going to be there tomorrow. He's talking, it could be weeks or months just in travel time to get to them. So they got plenty of time to get the test done to get the paper done, to to inspect their lives and and do the material, which is why he's warning them. He's like, because when I come, I'm going to have to actually, when you show up at five o'clock on Tuesday, the test is going to be on your desk. It's done. There's no more studying. It's time. And he says, look, I just want you to know you seek proof of Christ speaking in me. Well, he is not weak towards you, but powerful among you. We looked at this last week. Paul says, look, you guys are seeing Christ as weak in your life and in other people's lives. You see that he he can't really change my sin. He can't deliver me from my struggles and my problems. And Paul's like, no, he can. And you need to stop believing the lie that you're stuck in the mess you're stuck in. It's not true, Paul says. That is a false test. God can deliver you. Does that not mean that we have weaknesses? We looked at that a few weeks ago. Paul said he had a thorn in the flesh he played, prayed three times to get rid of. And God just looked at him and said, my grace is sufficient, Paul. I'm not taking this out of your life because it keeps you humble. Does that mean we don't struggle? Yes, we struggle. But he says, look, stop seeing God as so weak that you don't tell people about their sin and help them be delivered. Stop seeing Christ as weak. And stop seeing me as weak. Stop looking at your leaders and when they confront you, you see that as a weakness. Well, how dare you confront me? How dare you tell me this or that? No, see it as a strength that you have leaders, if they do it in love and compassion, that are concerned about your soul and the souls of other people. Like you should be like, man, I'm thankful for a professor who doesn't want me to become a doctor who doesn't know how to doctor and he just passes me through and then one day I'm working on a patient and they die and then I kill another patient and I kill another patient because I didn't learn the information. But we got Christians running around doing that. That they're selling death to people when they should be selling life. They're causing the death of people and them to be separated from God thinking that they are good with God when they're not good with God. And Paul's looking and he's saying, look, when I come to you, I'm going to deal with this stuff because I love you and because Jesus is so powerful. In fact, he was crucified in weakness, but he lives by God's power. He was resurrected. You can be resurrected. When stuff is dying in your life, you can kill the sin. And it's not like, well, I killed the sin. Now I can't ever be happy again because that sin made me so happy. And I had to give it up, and it was such a sacrifice, and this stinks. You know, I know I got like eternity and the God of the universe inside of me, and I got lots of people who love me or could love me if I'd let them. I mean, I know all that, but I'm really mad that I had to give up this. Th- that's our attitude so often. And that's what Paul's saying. He's like, no, 
He, he loves you. He, he was crucified in weakness and came to life so that you can have hope that when you crucify your flesh, when you say no to the things you want, you can find life in other things that will give you deeper, greater meaning in life than you ever could think you could have. And that's incredibly comforting. And then he says, for we are also weak in him, yet towards you we will live with him by God's power. Paul says, look, I get it. I'm weak too. I, I get that there's this struggle of can I be delivered in this power? But as a leader, I can't focus on my weakness. I, I have to talk about the power of God to be able to change you in your life. I, I can't just stay as you as a baby. I can't be like, oh, I just love my babies. And I just want to keep them as my babies and my babies. He's like, no, later he says, what? I want you to be mature. I don't want you to be a baby anymore. I want you to have children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. I want you to care for others. But so many people just want them to stay babies. No, I want you to grow in maturity, Paul says. That's what we want for you in our church, to grow into maturity. But maturity has a test. You can look and go, you're not mature. You can't walk. You know, you're not incapable of walking. You have all the right muscles and ligaments and brain function that you could walk. You just don't want to. You're not mature. We need to help you walk. Because if you don't learn to walk, you're not going to be able to live life well. So we're going we're to make you learn to walk. We're going to keep things from you. You ever do this with kids, right? You put something out there and be like, you, go get it. Like, how mean is that? When you're trying to teach them to crawl or walk, you're like, nice. And they're crying and rolling around and you're just watching them like, yeah, I know. It's good. Just keep, you'll get it. You know, and then you move it a little closer for them and they're, you know, and then they get it and you're like, yeah, good job. And then you move it a little bit further and they're like, wait, I just got it. Why'd you take it away from me? Because we're, we're, we're learning here. We're teaching. This is good. And you're like, I, that's what God does. He's no different. So Paul then says this. He's wrapping up his letter. He said for 12 chapters, all these things, like, I mean, cover so much ground biblically for 12 chapters. And then he says, look, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do... You yourselves not recognize that Jesus Christ is in you unless you fail the test. Whenever I read that word, examine yourself, for those of us who are in our 40s and 50s, when we go to the doctor, examining is very different than teenagers and 20-year-olds. It's very intrusive. The doctor goes and does things that are like, really? I would never let a human do that to me on the planet. What am I doing right now? The doctor looks at you and says, you need to take this special medicine and you're going to like sit on a pot for two days and you're going to then go get a colonoscopy and he's going to look in places that you're like, people shouldn't be in there. Like that's not appropriate, right? And then if you're having other problems and he goes the other way and he looks this way and you know, and you're like, I, there I am. And they take scans and your whole body's up there and there's an MRI and a CAT scan and an X-ray and you're like, Dang, I look horrible, right? And they're like, there's a problem, there's a problem. You're like, I didn't even, why did we have to even, how about we just do nothing? How about I just, I just live life and then when I'm ready to die, I die. Like I don't want anybody, no, we don't do that. Because we recognize that there are things in our culture, the way our food is, the way our life is, that if we don't continually be checked over time, that we will not have the longevity and prevention to give us a life where we can still have longer to build in and love people and care for people. So we allow ourselves to be examined. And it is amazing to me that people will allow doctors to examine them in the most intrusive, like crazy ways. For women, I mean, you go get a mammogram, that is intrusive. A mammogram, like really? That is painful. Like, I don't want to do this. Well, you should do it especially if you have a history of it in your family. You, like, we could save you possibly. Like, these are things. But then when it comes to spiritual things and a church that says, hey, we want to do some of those things too for you spiritually. Oh, no. How dare you? I didn't ask you to be intrusive. I didn't ask give you permission to speak into my... I don't... Why? Because we really don't value being tested and growing in our faith. We value living life. We value not getting colon cancer, not getting breast cancer. We value our health. But when it comes to our spiritual health, we're like, oh, I got Jesus. I'm good. 
I got heaven, got my ticket punched. I'm good. I passed the test. You pray a prayer, get baptized, check. Man, that breaks God's heart. I mean, can you imagine if you treat a relationship like that? Like if Andy and Evan woke up today and be like, well, I got you. See you later. You know, we, we, got the, we signed the license, we got married, everybody saw it. I'm going. I got to go somewhere. See ya. I thought we were going on a honeymoon. Nah, later. Not a big deal. I got you. That was the goal, right? I got you to marry me. Goodbye. We'd be like, that's horrible. But people, that's what people do with Jesus. And then they only, and then what if it, that person, he's like, see you, bye. And then they only came to check in when they needed something. Like six o'clock, they come back home, like, hey, you got dinner ready? Oh, no, okay, see ya. And then we left. And that's what Christians do with Jesus. It's like we only go to him when we have problems. Only when we finally have colon cancer do we go to the doctor and say, help me. And the doctor says, well, it would have been great if you would have been having checkups the last 20 years. But now I can't do anything for you. And so he looks and Paul says, look, do you, I want you, and here's what he says, look at this. Test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Most of you, when you read that, because you've been trained this way, most of you, when you read that, the first thing you think is, oh no, I might not be in the faith. That is a lie from the enemy. Paul says, I want you to test yourself so you can see you're in the faith. Like, you can be excited and recognize that Jesus is in you. Like, you can go, oh, I know Jesus. I know him. You know, like Alf, I know him. Like, it's beautiful. Like, that's exactly what he wants. And then he says, unless you fail the test. Like, Paul's assuming you won't fail. I mean, unless you do. Like, I love that Paul lays this out. He's like, test, see Christ, examine yourselves, want each other. Like, do that. And then, if... If you fail the test, ask why. Why did I fail the test? That's, a, that's what a good student does. That's what a good professor does. You can go back to the professor and say, look, I thought I knew this, but I failed. Could you help me? And a good professor will be like, of course. Let's sit down and look at what you didn't study. Let, let's see if maybe my teaching style was off. Let, let's look at this together. Maybe you're just, this is, that, you're not going to pass that test because you're not smart enough to pass that test. Like, but we don't even go back to God. What happens is we get depressed that we didn't pass the test and then we push Jesus aside, we push the church aside, and we're like, well, forget that. I'm going to do life on my own. You'll never mature, Paul says. Romans says this. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is God's power for salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew. In other words, salvation was given to the Jewish nation first and then went out from them. It's not like the Jews are better than the Gentiles. They got the message first. It was their job to take it to the ends of the earth that a Messiah was coming. And they failed the test miserably. They crucified their Messiah. Like they were supposed to tell people, Messiah's here. And instead they went, kill him. Like you can't fail a test more miserably than that. Like they failed miserably. And then he says, it was first for the Jew and now also for the Greek. For in Christ, or in God's righteousness, for in it God's righteousness is revealed from faith to faith. That's all the faith. That's Hebrews chapters 11 and 12. Faith to faith. All the faith of the fathers. The Bible. It's been revealed from faith to faith. That's what he's talking about when he says this. And then he says, look at this. Just as it is written, faith to faith, written, the Bible, this is your test. He says, the righteous will live by working as hard as they can to pass the test. Is that what it says? By faith. By saying, you know what? I don't measure up. I don't know if I can pass the test, but I know who can. Jesus Christ. And the power of the Holy Spirit that lives in me. So I don't have to pass the test on my own. And I have a body of believers. I have, a, I have people that will pray for me and help me. And, and I, I can pass if I get some study partners. <laughs> If someone holds me to help me to know the material, I, I can, I've got the power of the Holy Spirit in me. I've got Jesus himself revealing this to me. I can pass the test, no problem, because it isn't about me. I just have to place my faith in him. And it says, for God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all godlessness and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. You see, the reason that we fail the test is because we've already decided in our heart, God's not right and I'm going to do what I want to do. That's what Paul says there. I've already decided in my heart, God's not right and I'm going to do what I want to do. 
That's different than struggling with sin. It's different. It's different than saying, God, I don't want to do this. And then you do it and you feel miserable and you're like, God, I'm so sorry. I don't help me. And you like, that's good. That's good biblical conviction. (laughs) Praise God for that in your life. But so many of us, when we see the unrighteousness and the sin and the godlessness, we don't go back to faith. We start suppressing the truth and believing the lie that God has not made us righteous. He can't make us righteous. He doesn't have the power to make us. I'm a miserable wreck. I can't do anything. Blah, 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 blah. And you think the world wants that gospel? The world's wondering if they can be delivered. The world's wondering if Christ is real, if his power to save and his power to change people is real. Not in give them all the goodies, but the heart, the human heart be changed. And if we can't pass the test, then man, the world's in trouble. And that's what Paul's writing to the church in Rome and also to the church in Corinth. He goes on in Romans 8, Paul says this, On the contrary, what does it say? What does the scripture say? The message is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. This is the message of faith that we proclaim. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, like that he is Savior, that you surrender, that he's the boss, you're not. That's what Lord means, right? that he's Yahweh, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You don't earn it. It is a free gift given by faith. And then he says, one believes with the heart, resulting in making you right. You're not right by your works. You're right by, in your heart, surrendering yourself to the God of the universe. And then he says, and one confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. So you can believe in your heart and say, I think Jesus is who he says he is. I think he's who. But you have to declare it. That's what baptism is. That's what sharing our faith is. It's that declaration that I actually believe this is true. I'm declaring to the world. I'm not keeping this to myself because this is powerful. And then he says, look, now the scriptures say everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame. Even if you fail the test, if you're a believer, there is no shame. There's no shame. You just come back to the professor, you come back to Christ, and you say, I failed. I I, I see exactly where I failed. I see what I didn't study. You can come, you should be able to come to the body of Christ with that shame. You should be able to come to the communion table, which we'll celebrate today, with that shame. And hear Christ say to you, You don't need to be put to shame. You need to believe in the power of God in your life to change you. You know, if you struggle with this, Susan reminded me last week, my wife, of of this illustration. It's the train illustration. Fact, faith, and feeling. It's the idea that the fact is God, his word, his character, right? That's the engine that runs our life. Our faith is what we put in. It's like the coal car in in a steam engine. Our faith is what we put in to the engine for us to move somewhere. The caboose is the feeling. You can drive a train without a caboose. Most trains today don't have a caboose because it's just extra weight to carry around. (laughs) It's nice to have a caboose. It's a good place. You can go back and sleep. You can go up in the little tower there and look around, see what's going on. But you don't need the caboose. But you have to have the reality of who God is and a surrender of your heart in faith And then you've got to believe that God can change the feelings, that he can add to your life what he needs to add so that you can make a difference in the world and take his goods and his services to others in a way that can change lives because that's who he is. It's a beautiful diagram. If you get this out of order, if it's about faith and putting your, you know, I have faith in my faith in my faith, well, that's not what God says. You have faith in God. But so many people say you need to have faith in your faith. Well, I don't place my faith in my faith. I place my faith in the Lord. Because faith in my faith is going to fail me because I'm going to think about that decision I made by faith and think, yeah, but I had sin when I made that decision. And I don't know if I was really walking with God at that time. And I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Instead of saying, well, what does God say you should know? And if we try to run the train by feeling, well, we're just going to sit still. It's not going to go anywhere. And then we're going to get collided into by another train because we're on the tracks and we're just going to get blown up. And that's what happens to people in their Christian life. Ephesians says this, Paul goes on to say, for you are saved by grace through faith. This is not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not from works, so that no one can boast. 
The test isn't a works-based test because if it's a works-based test, we'll boast about it. We'll walk out of the test and be like, I got an A because I'm so smart and I spent so much time studying and because I got big brain, I'm a big brain guy. You know what I mean? And so like, I, that's why I did so well. It, did you do well? No, I didn't. Oh, so sad you don't have big brain. You didn't work as hard. God's like, that's not the test. The test is you walk out of the test and you say, hey, how did you do? And the person says, I, I did the best I could with the power of God in my life. And well, good, I, I did the best I could too. Let, let's walk together. Like that, that's the test is we did the best we could because, and we don't have to worry about the relationship. It's not like the professor is going to help us. If, I, if you fail and I pass, it's not like I can't go back and retake the test because I can because that's what Jesus offers to us. And then he says, for we are his creation, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time that we should walk in them. You can't get this out of order. We are saved by God's grace through faith, right? Then works. That's the order. Because you can't do works without God's grace, your faith, and then he gives you the power through the Holy Spirit to work for him. But if you're not seeing the works work, you need to ask and go back and say, what's wrong with my belief about grace and truth and what's wrong about my faith in the truth because I've got a works problem. He goes on and says this, James says this, in the same way, faith, if it doesn't have works, is dead by itself. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works and I'll show you my faith from works. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and they shudder. Foolish man, are you willing to learn? Are you willing to be tested? Are you willing to figure out that faith without works is useless? No, no, I got grace. I, I believe in Martin Luther, the five solas, like, you know, and Calvin. Like, I, I, I got it. Like, it, I, just, I just placed my faith in Jesus, that's it. Yes, that, that is, but then you're going to be tested on that decision throughout the rest of your life. And James says, if you're following God and serving him, you'll never doubt that decision because your works are going to match your love and you're just going to fall more deeply in love all the time with God and it's going to be beautiful, James says. He goes on and says this. John says this, so we've looked at Paul, we've looked at James, now we're looking at John. He says, dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to determine if they're from God, because many false prophets have gone out into this world. We've got to test the spirits. Is that the Holy Spirit doing the work, or is it me doing the work? And we don't teach people this. This is why people get caught up in all kinds of crazy teachings and nuttiness, is because it's like, no, test Go, go to the manual, go to the syllabus, it's right here. Go to the source material, this is primary source documentation. Go to the primary source documentation material and see if what you heard or what was said passes the overall test of the material. If you don't know the material, guess what? It's gonna be really hard for you to even understand how to test the spirits and how to pass the test. And you're gonna feel like a failure all the time. You may know Jesus. You may have grace, but Satan is going to grind you down to where you hate being saved and you hate having to walk with God because you don't love him. You haven't learned to walk and to crawl and to do the things you need to do. 2 Corinthians 2.9, Paul wrote earlier in the book, I wrote for this purpose to test your character to see if you're obedient in everything. So he starts the book by saying, I wrote to test your character and he ends the book by saying, Examine yourself. Test yourself. It's a good thing. Romans, Paul says this, For God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all godlessness and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. We looked at that a minute ago. Then he goes on to say, And because they do, did not think it worthwhile to acknowledge God, God delivered them over to a worthless mind to do what is morally wrong. Why would God do that? Because when you start doing really wrong moral things, your life starts spiraling out of control and becomes miserable, and that causes you maybe, just maybe, to finally cry out to God for help. And God is a gentleman. He will give you what you want. Is that what you want? Here you go. Have it. See how it works out for you. I'm here for you. When you figure out it doesn't work. 
I love you. He's a gentleman. And he says, I'm here. It's not the judgment time yet. You haven't died and stood before me, so have what you want. And that's what Paul's saying. Then he says, look at this. Although they know full well God's just sentence, so they know that, things, that their life's a wreck, they see the mess of it all, even though they know that God says that hell awaits for those who don't know Jesus, and that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they even applaud others who practice them. And that is where we are, folks, in a lot of our Christianity today. That's where the church in Corinth was when Paul's writing this. He's like, you know full well what God says about these things. You know full well that if you keep practicing this, you deserve to die. Now, notice, he just says deserve to die. Is it die spiritually? No. I had a pastor, Susan's pastor growing up, which we became a part of the church for about a year. We moved back to, uh, when we were coming on staff of the missions organization. He's now passed away, but I'll never forget. He, he said one time, and it just hit me. He said, look, God will never take away your salvation. He won't. But he may just take you out and say, you know what? I'm just going to bring you home to be with me because you're making a mess of my name. <laughs> and I love you. I love you. And I'm tired of you making a mess of my name. So I'll just kill you and you'll be perfect and be with me. Like, we'll just be done with this. And I, that always stuck with me. Like, yeah, Paul says, you may just die because you keep practicing this stuff. So God's like, yeah, I love you too much to let you practice this. <laughs> Hi, it's me. Like, <laughs> but so often... God allows us to struggle so that we can relate to others, they can relate to us. And then the question then becomes, do you applaud people who do terrible things? I see so many Christians that post online about loving things that I think, how can you love that? How can you be in support of Listen, I understand that sometimes you're in awkward situations and you don't know what to do and you don't know how to handle the situation. And so you personally choose to maybe do something that other Christians may not like. But when you post it for everyone to see, you are applauding it. You are saying, look at what I did because I'm so much more Christian than all of you. And when it's borderline, you're not sure, be careful with that. Because now you may be in the camp of helping people be applauded and practice things that are going to cost them their salvation and their soul. Like, don't do that. And yet it's just so easy to do. We just kind of go along with things instead of confronting things. And listen, to confront things doesn't mean you're mean. You can confront something and say, hey, I still love you. I just can't. That's not, you're just not going to do that. That's what parenting is most of the time. It's like, I love you. You're my kid. You're not going to do that. Especially when they're young. You're like, you're not going to do that. And if, if they still want to do it, then, then we just create a barrier and we stick them in the middle and go, look, you can't do it. You, you can't walk yet. You can't jump. You can't get over the fence. So how's that feel? And you know what they do? They just sit there and cry and scream. And uh, like their life is dying. You're like, you're protected. You're fine. Like, I will feed you in about two hours. I'm not going to starve you. Right? But you just don't want to fit. Sometimes God does that, and that's what we should have to do in relationships to help them become mature, Paul says. 1 Thessalonians says this. This is a good way to see if you're passing the test. Paul says, rejoice always. Pray constantly. Give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. There's the test. <laughs> How's your rejoicing doing? How's your praying doing? How's your giving thanks doing? Right? Because that's God's will. And then he says, don't stifle the spirit. Like, if something happens in someone's life and it's obviously God's work, not like they had some crazy thing happen and they call it the spirit, but you've tested it, don't stifle them, rejoice with them. And then he says, do not despise prophecies. That doesn't mean future telling people. A prophecy is the truth about God. Don't despise it when someone looks at you and goes, this is what I found out about God today. Don't look at them and go, I already knew that, you moron. Like, that is not encouraging. Like, if someone comes to you and they're, like, prophesying about what they discovered about God and how great it was, just look at them and go, man, that's awesome for you. That's great. You know? And then he goes on and he says, but test all things. Hold on to what is good. Stay away from evil every kind of evil. Now may God, the God of peace himself, sanctify you. That means make him more like you, set you apart for his work. And may your spirit, soul, and body, that's everything, be kept sound and blameless for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at this. He who calls you is faithful, who will also do it. 
He's going to do this. If you call yourself a Christian, you can't not be tested. He's going to do it because he loves you, because he wants the world to see, look at how much this person has changed. Look at what I did in their life. He wants to put you on display. He wants to, to give you the accreditation so that you can go do the job he has you to do, which is why you're in college taking tests, so that you can get a certain accreditation to do the job that you believe God wants you to do. And then he says, John says this, but the counsel of the Holy Spirit, the Father will send, this is Jesus speaking actually in John, but the counsel of the Holy Spirit, the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. He will remind you of everything I've told you, and he will testify about me. This is the plan of God. It's over and over. In 2 Corinthians, Paul goes on. He says, I hope you will recognize that we do not fail the test. Now we pray to God that you do nothing wrong, not that we may appear to pass the test, but that you may do what is right. In other words, he's saying, we're not asking you to pass the test so we look better. So we can say, see, see, I'm an apostle and they all follow me and they listen to me. See, I'm awesome. Paul's saying, no, 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 no. That's not why we're doing this. We're doing this because we love you. We want you to know Christ. And then he goes on and he says, but that you may do what is right, even though we may appear to fail. He's like, sometimes we're going to fail and you're going to be the ones that are right. Welcome to Christianity. Sometimes leaders get it wrong. It's one of my major problems with the Catholic Church. It's why it's so hard for me to find unity with Catholics. I think there are Catholics that are saved. They won't admit they were wrong and repent of things popes did. And declarations the church made that were wicked and evil. I just, that's all I need. I just need you to look and go, yeah, that was really bad. And then we think that Pope was evil, and we're sorry. Because he literally burned people at the stake for writing the Bible in another language other than Latin. And he sanctioned it. Yeah, that was evil. They've never done that. Because they so believe in the authority of the Catholic Church that the, you can't challenge the authority. Paul's saying, we're going to fail. And I hope you're walking with God so that when we fail, you can test us. He goes on and he says, for we may not be able to do anything, for we are not able to do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. I just want the truth. And if I'm not in the truth, help me. And if you're not in the truth, I want to help you. He says, in fact, we rejoice that when we are weak and you are strong, we rejoice that when we're struggling, you're, you're doing well. We also pray that you will become fully mature. Look at what James says. He can says, consider it great joy, my brothers, whenever you experience various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. There it is again, testing. How many, okay, that's like the 10th time, 8th or 10th time we've read the word test or examine in the New Testament. He goes on and he says, look, but endurance must do its complete work. You know when your work is completed, you know when your endurance is done, it's not when you turn 65, retire, and collect Social Security. That is not when you're done. You are done when Jesus says you're done. He calls you home. That's when you've been cooked, you've been baked, it's time to pull you out of the oven, and it's over. Until then, you're in the endurance game, right? That's what you're in. You're in I'm going to endure. It's going to be great. I'm going to love it. I'm learning how to endure. This is awesome. I was talking last night to a dad, two dads. I went to visit a friend I hadn't seen in years. It was his 50th birthday party, and his birthday party happened to be in Greenwood, which is where the wedding was. I'm like, I can't miss this. I grew up with this guy. Like, we grew up together, small children, until like, he moved, went to the military when he's 18, but I've seen him a few times after that. I'm like, I can't miss his 50th birthday. This is a great opportunity. We show up. Everyone there is dressed casual. We're dressed in the nines. You know what I mean? So everybody's like, who are you? We're like, sorry, we came from a wedding, you know? And it was just hilarious. Every person, the first guy that walked in, he walked in, he goes, oh, no. And we're like, no, 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 this isn't the expectation. You're good. You're good. He's like, okay. I was a little concerned. I was like not dressed up right for this, you know? He says, look, your endurance must complete its work. I just wanted to go home after a long Friday, after a long Saturday. I wanted to just kind of stop by the party quietly and be like, happy birthday, good to see you. I'm going to go watch some dry bar comedy now. See you later. We ended up being there for two and a half, three hours. Talking to people. I got to share my faith with two people. 
talking to Shane and seeing his life, encouraging his wife and saying, man, that you're married to Shane is amazing. It's a miracle. I've seen the change in his life. It's, he's different. He's not there yet. I'm not there yet. But man, it's amazing to watch and just to encourage him, to see his excitement. He looked across, and shocked me, right? And then another guy he saw from Chicago, he's like, Gunner, he's like blown away. Do you realize that that's why you're enduring? Because that's going to be the reception of heaven for you one day. You're going to cross that finish line and there are going to be people waiting. And they're going to just be like, ah, ha, ha. And there's going to be hugs and crying and like joy. And it's going to be awesome, not because you did it, but because Christ did it. And you guys are going to look at each other. And everybody wasn't looking at Shane. Everybody's looking at Tina and going, you did it. You did it. Everybody was giving her credit. Christ is going to get the credit. We didn't show up because of Shane. We showed up because Tina told us to come. <laughs> yes, we showed up because it was his birthday, but... She's the one that did the work. And that's a beautiful and beautiful thing. It goes on in 2 Corinthians. Paul says, This is why I'm writing these things while absent, that when I am there, I will not use severity in keeping with the authority of the Lord gave me for building up and not tearing down. He says, look, I don't want to come and have to be the boss. I don't want to come and have to use the authority that I carry to tell people to get out of the church and to deal with these things. I want you to love people now so that I don't have to come in severity and deal with these problems you haven't dealt with. Right? Again, it's maintenance. We don't like maintenance. It's maintenance. He's like, you need to maintain. And then what happens? A pipe bursts and you're calling a plumber on Christmas Eve and he's like, well, how long has this been leaking? Well, the ceiling was dripping for a few weeks and we just kind of just put a bucket under there and thought, oh, it'll go away. It'll be no big deal. You know, and you just let it go and let it go and let it go. And then on Christmas Eve, it bursts. You're like, please come and help me. And he's like, oh, this is going to cost you. <laughs> like, yeah, if I'm leaving my family on Christmas Eve. Yeah, that's a grand. I don't even know what your problem is. Just $1,000, <laughs> right? And you're so desperate at that point, you're like, sure. Like, my see, I got flooding going on. Paul's like, I don't want to have to come and be that severe. I want you to deal with the maintenance and caring that, that, ever, that we need to do so that when I can come, I can look and be like, wow, you've done a really good job maintaining it. This is awesome. This, this looks nice. And maybe I'll find a little problem. Be like, hey, there's a problem there. Have you thought of it? No, I never thought about that as a problem. Well, I can help you with that because I'm here now. We got time. He goes, I don't want to be in emergency mode. I don't want to be in last minute panic procrastination mode, Paul says. Let's deal with this. Deuteronomy, Moses, after he had finished reciting all the words to Israel, he said to them, take heart. Take to heart all these words I'm giving you as a warning to you today so that you may command your children to carefully follow all the words of this law. For they are not meaningless words to you, but they are your life. And by them you will live long in the land you are crossing the, Jor crossing the Jordan to possess. It's the same thing. God says, if you will live by my law, you will live forever in the land when you cross from this life to the other life to possess it forever. Know this. It's life to you. Your education isn't life. Your food isn't life. Your money's not life. This is life to you. This is the test. Do, do you want to be prepared? I do. Luke's challenged us as staff uh, at the beginning, like end of November, to read through the book of Isaiah for Christmas because there's so many verses in there. And I really did. I was done with Leviticus. I'd read through Leviticus and I didn't have the next book I was going to read. And so I thought, oh, this would be a good idea to start reading through Isaiah. I went to staff meeting on Friday. I'm like, this is a terrible idea to read through Isaiah. This is shredding me. Like God is just peeling off. And I'm like, I mean, if you looked at my notes in my Bible, it's like I got scribbles everywhere. I can't even get through my reading. Like I'm, I'm like, I get through a chapter. I'm like, I can't go any further. I got to go back and like, I'm like overwhelmed by it. I'm like 10 chapters behind in the reading. I'm like, but here's the thing. I'm loving it. It's been a while since I've read Isaiah and I'm reading through it. I'm like, oh, oh. I mean, it's beautiful. 
I didn't know that. And I've grown in my faith since I read Isaiah years ago. And I'm reading back through Isaiah and I'm seeing things like, I didn't understand that years ago. That's awesome. And it's like peeling off these layers that I didn't even want to peel off that obviously God through Luke needed to tell me, you know, and me submitting to his plan. Luke's like, I think this is what I'm going to do. I'm like, well, that sounds good. And it's beautiful. And I'm looking at the people and how Isaiah passed the test and him telling the people and he's warning them because he loves them. And I'm like, oh, this is so beautiful. So as we wrap up, let me give you Paul, what Paul gives you. Because when Paul says to examine yourselves and test yourself, he ends the book, he ends the book, are you ready for this? By giving you all the answers. The way he ends 2 Corinthians is he literally says, okay, I've talked about the test, I've talked about it, now I'm just going to give you, when you walk in the class, it's going to be multiple choice, and here are the answers. Bam, 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 bam. Fill in the blank. Boom, here they are. This is what he says. Finally, brothers, rejoice. Test number one. Do you rejoice? Do you rejoice? Or are you so upset with God, you're complaining, you're mad, you're like... I'm struggling with rejoicing. I'll just be honest with you today. Because Susan and I, we, we bought a couch that doesn't fit in our room. <clears throat> yeah, y'all feel it, don't you? You feel it. We failed the test. We, 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 it's, it's, it's a failure. And I'm, I'm like... I don't know what you have in store for us and what this plan was, God, to do this. I, I don't know, but boy, did we fail this one. And both of us, like Malia came over, she's helping us move the furniture in 10 different spots in the room. And she looks at us, she's like, uh, I'm, I'm gonna go home now. And she just left. <laughs> Cause she's like, now can I find it in my heart just to rejoice that again, God is looking at me and saying, Matt, you can't figure it all out. It's okay. I love you. You bought a couch. But it's not a soul. It's not a life. It's just a couch. Rejoice. Rejoice that you can fail. And I still love you. And your wife still loves you. And here's the best part. Rejoice that you failed together because it wasn't just me. <laughs> woo Like... Yes, together we fail. Because <laughs> most of the time it's just me failing. <laughs> he goes on, he says this, become mature. Just become mature. Grow up. That's going to take a while. You're not going to, it's, maturity is a process. Be a part of the process. Be around parents and people that will help you mature. Then he, he simply says, be encouraged. Why? Because it's going to be hard to rejoice and it's going to be hard to mature. So be encouraged because this is the process. Find encouragement in me. Find encouragement in Christ. Find encouragement that you, that you are passing the test. Even when you think you aren't, Jesus is still working in you to pass the test. Because that's what he promised. We read three times today that that's what he's doing. So don't doubt that. Don't let the enemy challenge. No, Jesus is going to help you pass the test. Be encouraged, even if you feel like you're failing. Then he says, be of the same mind. So be encouraged and then be of the same mind. That way when you fail together, you can repent together. <laughs> and when you succeed together, you can rejoice together. And the mind you want to be of is not the same mind selfishly, but the mind of Christ. And then he says, be at peace. Be at peace. Now, you can only be at peace as long as it depends on you. But he says, be at peace. Find peace, not in your circumstances and in the feelings around you, but find peace in Christ and find peace that he is helping you pass the test and enduring in him. And then he says, the God of love and peace will be with you. So he knows you're going to struggle with peace. So he says, I know you're not going to feel peace. So just remember, he's the God of love and peace. And he's with you. If you know him, he's, he's with you. And then he says, you know what you need to do for each other? Greet one another with a holy kiss. When was the last time you kissed someone holy? Right? That the kiss you gave someone was a holy kiss. Most of the time in our culture, kisses are lust kisses. They're not holy kisses. 
It's all about lust. Even in marriage, a lot of kissing goes on because it's like I'm communicating what I want, right? I'm going to be really nice to you and love on you and kiss you because we need a new couch, right? Or I want to have sex tonight or whatever it is versus I just want to greet you with a holy kiss that rejoices in you, that's thankful that we're maturing, that wants to encourage you because we have the, that they have the same mind, we're at peace, and because of who God is, I just, I just want to just say, I, I love you. <laughs> like, it's beautiful. That's what he wants. And then he says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. That's how Paul ends the book. You want to be so comforted? He says, be comforted in the grace of Yahweh, who is Yahweh, who saves, who is the Messiah, and his love that he showed through his death and his resurrection and the fellowship together that we celebrate communion as fellowship saying, I'm good with God, the Holy Spirit, because he's changing me and he's helping me to be comforted and pass the test. That's what communion is. We're going to take communion. Communion is a test. It's there for us to examine our hearts. Paul says that in Corinthians. He, in 1 Corinthians, he says to examine yourself before you take the bread and the cup to see if Christ is in you. And if he is, then celebrate the bread and the cup, his blood and his body, because he's the bread of life and he's the living water that we get. So celebrate that. You may be struggling. You may not think you're worthy to take the bread and the cup. It's not about you being worthy. It's about you saying, I believe Christ is who he says he is. And I can take that, and even if I'm a mess, I can say, I declare you are the Lord Jesus Christ. That's communion. But if you're not ready to declare that, if you're not ready to say that in your heart, if you're like, eh, I don't know about, then do not take communion. Because it's just a lie. Let me pray for us, and then I'll open up the table. Father, thank you this morning for your tests. Thank you this week for the tests that are happening to help students here learn the direction they need to take with their life, to learn the changes they need to make by which to serve you and others well. Lord, I thank you this morning that you help us pass this test. We're not on our own. It's by your grace and our faith that we place in you. And Lord, I thank you that that faith does produce fruit. It produces works. But we're not trying to work to get grace and faith. We work because we're so grateful we have it because of what you've done. Lord, I pray that if anyone here online has never surrendered their life to the fact that you are the Lord Jesus Christ and your grace that's been offered through your death and your resurrection, they would do it today. And if they do it in this moment, then they can for the first time take communion and celebrate it. Because communion is just the recognition that you did it. And for those of us who are believers, Lord, I pray that we would take seriously how great it is. That we would rejoice that you are helping us pass the test. And even though we may fall down, you pick us up like a parent teaching us to walk because you want us to grow in maturity. And I thank you that you are patient and long-suffering with us. And we see that through the Bible. And for those of us who are walking closely with you, protect us from pride. Help us to not be prideful, but to see that at any moment, without your blood, without your bread, without the word of God and the living water that you provide and the power of your Holy Spirit, we're done. And would we be humble when we take the cup and the bread? We pray all this in your name, because you are the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.